namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa aparutha desangamathassa thavara e sarvanta bamunjandu satam So this afternoon, a reflection to keep pointing to the here and now, the way it is, is like this. So it can be referred to as a wide open unknowingness. You don't know anything, but there's just awareness. It's like this is open, listening, not thinking, judging, discriminating. No past, no future. And so the worldly life is about movement and change. Where Bhāramatta Satcha or Dhamma is about silent stillness. So Dhamma is silent here and now timeless, where the world is about your body, how it changes, how your senses change, how life changes, externally, internally, the body gets older, gets illnesses, societies change and climate changes, this is the world that we experience through the senses. So the Buddha is pointing to Dhamma rather than to trying to <clears throat> explain the, the sensual world and saying in terms of what it should or shouldn't be. The Buddha doesn't mention how the world should be or shouldn't be. But the world is this relentless, inexorable changingness that we experience through the senses that we have. So where is the Dhamma? Because the world, the world of the senses is considered in modern jargon to be the real world. But in Buddhism, it's the illusory world, it's illusion, it's change, it's undependable, unstable, changing, dependent on conditions. And just to contemplate the function of language, as I've reflected many times, how language is very divisive. And that's its function. It's part of the world. The world is, is, has languages, has views, opinions, 
religions, organized religions have views and opinions about what's moral, immoral, what's right, what's wrong, and it goes on and on like that. And this is the world that we, out of ignorance of Dhamma, out of ignorance of the silence behind the noise, we identify with the world, and that's why we suffer. Because the world isn't what it should be. You aren't the way you should be, but you are the way you are. Right now it's like this. So we, we have, you know, we get bachelor's degrees, master's, PhDs, and evaluating the world and all its various facets. It's interesting, it's boring, it's stupid, it's intelligent, it's right and wrong, good and bad, what should be, what shouldn't be. And this is all about language, isn't it? It's the, when we have language, then we see things in terms of right and wrong. In religions, we can consider our religions right, and other religions are wrong. Theistic religions are wrong. Our religion is right. And on and on like that. So we we evaluate things according to opinion, what we've been told by others, what we believe. And we tend to express these opinions and views, believing completely in that I'm right, and if you don't agree, you're wrong. But is Dhamma right or wrong? If I take refuge in Dhamma, is it about right and wrong? Is there wrong Dhamma? Is there right Dhamma? And, uh, you know, then we try to think of Dhamma in terms of good and bad, true and false, right and wrong. <clears throat> but Dhamma is still silent, perfect. It's apparent here and now. It's timeless. So, waking up, like the Buddha, the actual word means awaken. Wake up. And see, Dhamma is here and now, timeless. Ehi Pratiko, come and see for yourself. You know, kind of an invitation or encouragement. But even with Buddhism, we can be caught in our own views about right and wrong, and we might be clever, intelligent, and have very intelligent views about how things should be. There's nothing wrong with that. But right views, when we, and we talk about the Eightfold Path, we talk about right view, and right is a bit dodgy, actually. It's perfect view. When you realize Dhamma for yourself, that's enlightenment. Suddenly you're, you're awake. Your true nature is here and now, not the forms that you have to endure for the life's fan of your body. So righteousness is a problem with, with religions and polit politics. Just listening to the propaganda, political propaganda of the day and, and the name calling and the uh, criticisms, 
that you hear, you know, that and who's right and who's wrong and who's the monster and who's the savior and and on and on like that. We form opinions about our political leaders. So these opinions, you know, then we tend to project them onto others. And if you don't agree with me, then you're wrong. You're not a true Theravadan Buddhist if you believe in bodhisattvas and that's Mahayana. So did the Buddha teach Mahayana or, you know, then we can get caught in, in doubt or in belief. <laughs> and so, you know, to be a, a true absolutely true to Theravada Buddhism can make us very critical of any other other uh, views about Buddhism that aren't exactly in line with our particular view of Theravada. So this happens in Christianity between Catholics and Protestants, evangelicals, the whole history of, of wars and misery caused by righteous views. Now, righteous views, sometimes we can't help having, you know, because that's when uh, that's we're caught, we're conditioned to to believe in right and wrong, good and bad almost as absolute. So the conditioning makes us, you know, attached to a viewpoint that we've been told by someone else, maybe a, your mother or father or a priest or a pastor or a rabbi, and you're told this is absolutely the true, this is God's will, God wants it to be this way. And so you believe that, you believe what you're told. And when things conflict with that particular view, then the forces of evil, temptation, hell raises its ugly head because if, you, if you're wrong, you go to hell. So just to reflect on these, you know, to be able to be the knower of these thoughts, in order to be stop thinking or to be critical of thinking, because to be critical of thoughts is still thinking. So it's by being the witness to the way it is. Thinking is like this. And so you start listening. Rather than trying to get rid of your ego, you're listening to it. So the ego says one thing, but you're, you're the listener, you're not the ego anymore, you let go. So this is a kind of abandonment, letting go of conditioning freeing yourself from just the habitual ways of belief, ways of thinking, identity with your body, with the emotions you're feeling. It's, uh, I, I like to see it as listening. I listen to my ego. After all the years, do I still have an ego? You know, have I gotten rid of it? Or 
do you detect egotism in me? Do you give these uh, reflections, my lifestyle? Do you, you can see it as egotistical in some way, that is critical, because I'm, you can, according to the ideal, if I didn't have an ego, you have an ideal of getting rid of the ego, destroying the ego, rather than witnessing the ego. So you can't destroy the ego because the power of the worldly dhammas affects us. What somebody says, how somebody looks, affects us. If somebody looks at you in anger, you, whether they say anything or not, you, you kind of feel it. Even though they might not be angry with you, when an angry person comes into the room, you, you feel it because that emotion is, is, is quite strong. Then when we speak on anger, then we really, we get attached to our angry view. We want to set things right. We want to be considered right and, and put them in their place, seek revenge. And is that wrong to feel the desire for revenge? According to the ego, we can feel guilty about wanting to get even with somebody because according to metta practices, we should love everybody, forgive, and uh, let things go, which is good advice, to forgive, to spread loving kindness. That's good advice. So we tend to feel guilty when we get angry, and we might say something when we're angry that we regret. Then we feel guilt or shame. So then we want to apologize for our mistakes, which is good. But still, it's like uh, this person, me, apologizing for for something I've said or done that offended you in some way. Now, the knower of this, the listener, is aware of these tendencies. Some are good tendencies, like asking for forgiveness is a good thing to do, good action, good speech. Do not speak on anger when, you, when you're aware. Then you're aware of the anger. And let it go, meaning you, you don't get rid of it. You still feel it because it's part of the, the conditioning that we have through, through this sensual realm. But we don't speak or act on it. So I've oftentimes reflected in my monastic life how I rejoice in all the things I've never said but felt. So feeling is like this. When somebody insults you or abuses you in any way, then you feel this way. You know, no matter how alert and mindful you are, you're still going to feel something because this is a feeling realm. The body is a sensitive form of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, a brain. This realm that we have to experience heat and cold, hunger, thirst, fatigue, pleasure, pain.
So this is about the worldly dhammas that that we experience through these forms that we tend to, out of ignorance of dhamma, we identify with. Now the dhamma we take refuge in has no form, it's formless, but is apparent here and now. So you can't see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it. When you try to think about it, then you're caught in the thinking realm again. You can't reach it with thought, with the most intelligent kind of theories and ideas. But awakeness means you realize this for yourself, the pure, perfect Dhamma, apparent here and now, timeless. While the world is falling apart around you, it might be, you know, things go through phases of development and decay, change, I remember learning I was a head monk and like in Chithurst, the uh, you know I felt I wanted to establish the perfect monastery, and so I wanted perfect monks, perfect nuns, perfect people, but nobody that came to Chithurst was perfect, so. <laughs> So, so just by reflecting on that, that none of us are perfect monks or perfect nuns, perfect lay people, perfect women, perfect men. These are ideals. And wanting to live in an ideal world is, you know, you're never going to find that world because it doesn't exist. It's imagination. So to know the world is awakeness. We have to experience the world through the body and senses, but we awaken to it that it is impermanent and that it's not self. You can't find your real self through worldly conditions. You're not the earth element, the fire element, the water element, the air element. You're not earth, fire, water, and air. You're not anything that you can imagine, think about, perceive through the senses. So we stop trying to find Dhamma through belief in ideas about Dhamma or what great teachers tell us Dhamma is, but we begin to look inward, Opanayaka Dhamma. Instead of seeking Dhamma as some object we, we hope to realize and find, we, don't ha we can't find it because this is what we are, because you're a parent here and now. Before you identify with the body or the thoughts or the emotions, So I remember a feeling sometimes that some of the monks, nuns were, would be just perfect bhikkhus and siladharas and then they disrobe and leave and then you're disappointed because the ones that you had great confidence in leave and disappoint you and you had these hopes that they would be the enlightened masters of Dhamma to carry on the teaching in the future. And so you, you, uh, you know, with, by clinging to these ideals, 
then when things change the way you, you don't want them to be, then you feel disillusioned, disappointed. You might take it personally. It's my fault. You know, it's one way of interpreting experience, or we can just say they don't have the the accumulated virtues, bar me, to carry on. So we can put them down as not having the, the seeing the real Dhamma. That's one excuse. Or we might doubt the tradition, or, you know, so we the ego will say anything. You know, we have certain tendencies, like some people are always blaming others for what's wrong, or others are blaming themselves. The introverts blame themselves. It's probably my fault. I shouldn't have said that. I'm disappointed. I've failed as a teacher, as a ajahn, as a monk. Or I blame everyone else. It's just that you're not good enough. You misunderstood. You don't really understand. You're stupid. Or you don't have the bar of me, the accumulated virtues to live the holy life. These are rationalizations that we make when we feel discouraged or disappointed or disillusioned. Now, listening to these, whether it's being introverted or, or extroverted, whatever terms you want to use, that which is aware, is listens, this silent awareness is receptive, apparent here and now, conscious awareness here and now. So listening to yourself, Rationalize, justify, blame. We all do it, but those some have a believe their own rationalizations, their own views and opinions aren't in, looking in the right place. They're still going outward, expecting life to be what they think it should be, how things should go the way. I believe what I think. I know better than everyone else. And let me tell you what's right and wrong. And that becomes a dictator. Dictatorships. You know, you don't believe what I say off with your head. But awakened one, Awakened human being is a listener, learns from that, that whatever emotions, habits you have, whether extroverted, introverted, blaming others or blaming yourself, these things are all based on thoughts, on views, on opinions. They come and go, they flow. They're the moving, flowing stream. in the stillness of silence. So in terms of when the Buddha said, I leave you the Dhamma Vinaya, the Dhamma the Vinaya is, is changing form. It's about right and wrong or skillful, unskillful. Dhamma is not about right and wrong, skillful, unskillful. So the Dhamma, since it has no form, you can't really, you can point to it. Like the Buddha's teachings are all pointers at here and now, timeless. Ehi Pasiko, see for yourself, wake up, be the observer, the witness. Find out for yourself, rather than just believe what the scriptures tell you or 
enlightened masters tell you, you find out for yourself. So it's bhajatang vaitidapa vinuhi, to realize this for yourself. So I personally found it quite interesting to just listen you see, you know, I begin to see so how, how arrogant I can be or the thoughts that, that I can have or can be very cold calculating or can be very emotional or indifferent. They can be right or wrong. But that which is aware of these thoughts, these emotions, isn't right or wrong, it's here and now, it's mindfulness, conscious awareness, here and now. And this is where we actually find ourselves always in the here and now. The winter's retreat, the month of January is past, we've got two months left of this precious time. Some people think the world is, you have to experience worldly dhammas. There's something to explore, or you have to learn from the world. And this is more thinking. The world is impermanent. And this, you know, so it's, I remember being a, a graduate student in the University of California, Berkeley, in 1960, and how the philosophy of the hippies was beginning to influence the student body at Berkeley. This kind of, the drug scene was beginning, and the idea was to experience life, experience everything, right or wrong, you know, given the right to explore life, to explore the world through action and speech, which seemed very nice when you're young. Suddenly when you've been brought up about having to behave yourself and uh, the very kind of moral conditioning and suddenly sex is available and drugs and alcohol and freedom to explore life sounds Terribly exciting. But then, you know, you realize through that, that, that you know, you, there's, it's all empty. You know, people get addicted, get obsessed with sex or drugs. And then you lose self-respect because just following every desire, every movement of your mind with action or speech isn't a way to even respect yourself. It doesn't lead to happiness. It gains momentary kind of pleasure or excitement, but that's very impermanent. Where, you know, I find personally, you know, in my own experience of being a monk, it's a lifestyle I respect. When I met Lung Cha in 1967, you know, I kind of, it was, I had ideas about a good, what a good monastery should be and what Bapung seemed to fit my ideals at the time. And so, uh, learning to live within the uh, Vinaya precepts and all that was 
it wasn't easy, but it certainly gave me a sense of I can do it. I respect that I'm taking responsibility for, I'm learning to, um, to do things like bowing to a teacher, bowing to a Buddha Rupa, you know, and when you've been brought up in the American Christian tradition, you shouldn't bow to anybody. Bow to golden images and find myself bowing to golden images. So the conditioning, the Christian conditioning, is one way, but then the actual experience of bowing to a Buddha Rupa, being aware, using bowing as a way of awareness, suddenly you know you 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 feel this sense of respect because the Buddha Rupa to me is a very beautiful icon. I don't project onto them kind of special powers like some people do, that some Buddha Rupas have a certain psychological, metaphysical powers. I can, you know, you can project that onto them, but they are in terms of just physically as icons, religious icons. They're the human form in a state of awareness. So this Buddha Rupa behind me, the golden image, you know, I found it very beautiful. Because the Buddha is aware, he's not shutting his eyes, he's not plugging up his ears, holding his nose, he's, his senses are still operating. And that's a beautiful icon in religious terms because so many religious icons are about misery and pain, crucifixion, hearts with thorns around them, things that are rather gruesome. Where in this, this particular tradition, the Buddha Rupa is, you know, this is my how I see it, how I relate to Buddha Rupa, is that they're a, a beautiful, iconic form to be respected. Well, maybe that's an opinion and a view. It is, in itself. But there's a knowing of that. It's only that, it's an opinion, a view that I've developed. So it doesn't mean I have to get rid of all views or say Buddha Rupa is empty phenomena and that's all, but because that's true, it's, it's phenomenal and it's empty, but then in terms of experience, you know, in terms of sensory experience, this is an opinion that I find pleasant to hold to, but not be attached to. If there are no Buddha Rupas, it's still okay. It doesn't have to be Buddha Rupas. Because Dhamma is apparent here and now and timeless. In the training process, training under Vinaya. You know, Ajahn Chah was very clear in his direction of being the witness to the way it is. So I respected that. He wasn't telling me how I should be and how, I do, how to behave, but being a witness to conform to the Vinaya tradition that was practiced at Wat Pa Pong at that time. To be aware of whether you like it or don't like it, agree with it or disagree with it, it's fair enough. It's all thoughts rising and ceasing. So from a Western-trained ego 
and social conditioning, religious conditioning, that was very much the, a lot of the Vinaya rules I didn't understand. I thought they were superfluous, unnecessary, fussy. So I listened to these, to my own criticisms of the Vinaya, rather than thinking I've got to believe that this was established by the Buddha, so it's perfect. Because I trusted, you know, the direction of being the witness and my social religious conditioning was very much uh, based on Christianity or Western ideals, Western idealism. And I can actually witness that. It's something that comes and goes and changes. And then, and then the Thai culture and the monastic forms would reflect oftentimes uh, the, the American conditioning because it was very different. Conditioning is conditioning. It can be different, like from Britain to America to Australia to France. Thailand, India, you know, the conditioning is not, social conditioning is not uniform. It can be very different from one country, from one state to another. But the witnessing isn't European or Asian. It's not personal. It's apparent here and now timeless. So in Sangha life, there are strong views and opinions that we hear or can upset us or that we agree with. But we can be aware that of this, of being aware of our own tendency to, to being right and imposing my righteous views on you is uh, one can be aware of that tendency because my true nature is Dhamma, apparent here and now, timeless, deathless. Sangsara is all about death. We're all going to die. These forms sitting here in the sala, in the temple. You know, we know that. But we don't like to be reminded because we, we want to live, we want to be happy, we want to be right, we want to be understood, loved, cared for, appreciated. So as personalities, you know, we can be constantly frustrated because our personalities aren't going to be the same and agree, live in agreement, but in conflict. And so we began to realize for ourselves, Dhamma, it's a realization, it's real, it's here and now. It's not something created or born. It's invisible. You can't see it or find it because that's what you are. So I offer this as a reflection.